Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Sabir, and I direct events here at The Strand. We are so happy to have everyone here, particularly considering the state of the world. This is actually our first virtual event as a team, and we're so excited to have it with someone with such a valuable point of view, especially regarding COVID-19 and everything going on. Before I hand it over to Dr. Afri, I'd love Oh, free. my apologies. I'd like to share a little bit of history about The Strand. The Strand was founded in 1927 by Benjamin Bass over on Fourth Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled from 48 bookstores until after 93 years, Strand is the sole survivor, now run by third generation owner Nancy Bass Wyden. We want to thank all of you for your support. Without our loyal community of book lovers, we wouldn't be here today. We are very much looking forward to safely reopening our doors and as soon as we can, greeting you all in person. Tonight, we're excited to have with us Dr. Danielle Ofri. Danielle is a clinical professor of medicine at the New York University School of Medicine and has cared for patients at New York's Bellevue Hospital for more than two decades. She's the author of several acclaimed books, including What Patients Say, What Doctors Hear, What Doctors Feel, and Singular Intimacies. Dr. Ofri is a regular contributor to the New York Times, as well as to the New England Journal of Medicine and the Lancet. She has been on the front lines of the coronavirus crisis, working in the COVID tent at Bellevue, an experience she recently wrote about in a New York Times op-ed that we linked to in the Facebook group for the event. Danielle is with us to launch her new book, When We Do Harm, A Doctor Confronts Medical Error. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Dr. Ofri and let's start the event. Hi everyone, good evening. Um, it's really nice to be here. Thank you for taking the time to join me. Um, it is very odd to be having a book launch in the middle of this pandemic. And I don't know if you can hear, but it's seven o'clock and here in New York, seven o'clock is when everyone goes out and bangs on their you know, windowsills and bangs on pots and pans as a show of support. It's, it's very, very inspiring. You know, um, when you plan a book, you know, it's kind of like a baby. When you plan it, you know, nine months or 18 months ago, you don't really know what the weather's going to be like on the day that it comes out. And for my last book, it came out in January of 2017. We thought, oh, that's a pretty low key time, but it turned out to be the week after the inauguration. And, um, let's just say the weeks that follow were pretty active. So we thought for this book, let's get as far from the November election as possible. You know, how about March, April? You know, what could possibly happen in March or April other than spring break? So who knew? Um, so it's been a very busy March and April at Bellevue and all the hospitals. And, and just before starting, I just wanna give a real acknowledgement and shout out to my colleagues at Bellevue, at NYU, at all the hospitals in New York in particular, but all around the country and really around the world who are facing just something that um, we haven't been with before. It, for many of us, it feels like the way HIV was, but at the rate of Hurricane Sandy and with the tenor of 9-11. Um, and, and lots of my colleagues are working tonight and, and a real appreciation uh, for all of this. Um, so I wanna step away from that a little bit and talk ab about uh, medical error, a topic that's really been on my mind for the last couple of years. And, and back in the spring of 2016, my editor at Beacon Press emailed me an article. Um, you know, when you're one of the few nurses and doctors at a publishing house full of English majors, you get everyone's medical questions. And so this one was an article that said that uh, medical error is the third leading cause of death. And this was a study that came out in the British Medical Journal that garnered an enormous amount of press and, and headlines, very similar to, the, um, to, to 20 years ago when to err is human the big medical error report from the Institute of Medicine, which estimated that up to 98,000 Americans per year were dying of medical error, the equivalent of a jumbo jet and a half crashing every day on US soil. And so the image of the crashing jet became the defining metaphor for medical error. And in this piece that came out um, was an analysis of the data that suggested that medical error could be the third leading cause of death. And that really grasp people's you know minds it was a very frightening thing and so my editor said to me is this really true and the truth is I didn't really know the answer to her question and I thought um huh either it is true 
but I'm not seeing it because, you know, I work in a busy place. Bellevue is pretty busy and, and I see a good cross section as do my colleagues and patients out there today. And if medical error is really the third leading cause of death, we should be seeing that every day, but we're not, or it feels like we're not. And so I wondered whether, um, or are we just blind to it? Are we completely, you know, not, you know, are we just ignoring and we have blinders on and can't see all the harm we're doing to patients or are the data wrong? And it's really, you know, that's not the case. And that became the impetus to, to um, you know, going into this uh, area of research. So I'm gonna just read you uh, two paragraphs from the beginning of the book about sort of how we came to this point in, in uh, the history of medicine. If the history of medicine over the past 200 years were a feature film, it would be a swashbuckling adventure epic. Heroes in white coats would brandish stethoscopes and pipettes, decapitating disease in single fell swoops with their medical machetes. Sanitation, antisepsis, and anesthesia would hurl across the screen, flattening 19th century illnesses. Vaccines and antibiotics would explode like grenades across the early 20th century rescuing the masses from infectious marauders. Our triumphant superheroes would swagger into the second half of the 20th century, whirling about to execute 360 degrees of jujitsu strikes, chemotherapy, dialysis, antipsychotics, blood transfusions, birth control, CT scanners, cardiac catheterization, ICUs, statins, antihypertensives, HIV treatment, slaying every dragon in the room with hardly a backward glance. The movie would be one straight trajectory of progressive victory over disease, nearly doubling average life expectancy before you even approach the unpopped kernels at the bottom of your greasy popcorn box. Staggering success has been the dominant leitmotif in medicine, with good reason. Turning once uniform killers into afterthoughts is an impressive feat that should not be taken for granted. But this theme of relentless victory hasn't left much space in the narrative for talking about the medical errors and adverse outcomes of our treatments. At best, these were annoying pebbles along the road upon which our heroes constantly strode. It's not that medicine does not examine errors. Morbidity and mortality rounds, affectionately known as M&Ms, have been part of medicine for a century. M&Ms were, and still are, formal evaluations of bad outcomes but the rugged individualism of our medical heroes filtered through to our analysis of medical mistakes, with the general approach being to figure out what, or more often who, had malfunctioned and then fix that one thing. Still, these errors were seen as mere footnotes to the inevitable, to the inexorable sense of progress. All would get fixed by the indefatigable advances of medical research. And I think that's one of the issues of medical error. We haven't really wanted to talk much about medical error. And in fact, we've broadened the idea of medical error to the concept of preventable harm. That is all harm to patients, even if it wasn't an error. For example, if a patient gets a CAT scan and ends up with renal failure from the dye they were given, it's not an error, but certainly not what you wanted when you were giving the patient the scan. So these are all in the kind of broader tent of um, patient harm or preventable error, or adverse outcomes. And so we're trying to think a little more globally about how to make uh, medicine safer for all of us. After all, we're, we're all patients, whether we start out as doctors, nurses, or, or average civilians. And um, medicine's often told to, you know, take a page from the airline industry. You know, and for those of us who can remember flying from a couple of months ago, we hope it's not the page, you know, about legroom or about getting our bags on time. But the idea of the aviation checklist has really taken hold in medicine. And it's been very successful in, in certain kinds of medical errors or adverse outcomes. So things like preventing infection from central lines or preventing um, uh, harms during surgery in the pre-surgical checklist, making sure you have all the equipment you need and all the people you need, you check the patient and the site of the operation, reviewed possible complications. That's had remarkable success in bringing down the complication rate of surgery. And what's interesting is that it's worked equally well in you know, high-end uh, academic medical centers in the US and Europe, as in under-resourced hospitals in Africa and Asia. Uh, and it's quite remarkable how it seems like this you know, piece of paper with a couple of boxes can really uh, save people from getting killed. And so the media again went to town with this because here it was, this sort of low tech little sheet of paper that you know 
miraculously keeps all those jets from falling out of the sky. And so um, hospital administrators fell in love with the idea of checklists and began checklisting everything in the hospital from DNRs to blood clots, to infection prevention, to discharges. I mean, you, could, you couldn't even get a Snickers bar from the vending machine without encountering some kind of checklist. And if hospital administrators love checklists, well, you can imagine how much government administrators love checklists. In um, 2010, the Minister of Health of Ontario decided that all hospitals in the great province of Ontario would use this pre-surgical checklist. I mean, they could do it in New Delhi in Tanzania, it would be a cakewalk in rule abiding Canada, right? So they had every hospital use this checklist and they had an enormous data gathering machine and getting themselves ready to show how you can improve patient safety on a grand scale. Well, it didn't quite work out the way they expected. And they managed to get an almost 100% compliance rate with the checklist, but mortality rates and complications didn't budge, not an inch. No matter how they sliced and diced the data by age, by sex, by severity, by comorbid conditions, they couldn't find one hint of improvement. And that seems sort of startling, right? You can use the checklist anywhere, and yet somehow in, in a well-established country, a well-established province like Ontario, it didn't work at all. And I think it's because, you know, we humans we're enamored of these catchy, easy solutions, right? You got a piece of paper, five check boxes, boom, we're gonna take care of everything. But we're much less interested in the very boring science of implementation. Right? Implementation is how you get that checklist to work with the actual human beings that are gonna do that, right? In an airplane, most of the moving parts are moving parts, but in medicine and healthcare, most of the moving parts are human beings nurses, doctors, technicians, patients, and families. And so just putting a piece of paper with five check boxes isn't really gonna do it. So the implementation is the really sort of dull and dreary details of, oh, where will the supplies be? And who do we call if we run out? And who's in charge? And what happens when we're short staffed? And who's gonna bring the coffee? And all the little things that go into making the checklist work or any intervention. So I'm gonna share with you uh, one more short reading of a patient safety intervention in our hospital that was affected by, by implementation. And this has to do with the electronic medical record. And so the EMR, um, and many of you know, I have very mixed feelings about the EMR, but it's done many wonderful things for patient safety, right? It eliminates the handwriting issue with prescriptions and um, you can read the ophthalmologist's notes, even if you don't know what they actually say, but you can read them, they're all in print. You can get medical records from other institutions. Um, but even when we use the EMR, we can still introduce mistakes. One morning in my clinic, I was seeing my first patient of the day. I noticed that the EMR looked a little different that morning. Apparently, there had been some sort of rollout of various uh, updates overnight, um, sometime in the wee hours of the morning, and now a bunch of minor things were out of order and they were tripping me up. For example, and this is in our previous medical record, my fingers knew automatically that Spanish was number 41 when it came to which language the patient spoke, since Spanish is our most common second language. And of course, you know, knowing what language the patient speaks is an important safety intervention to make sure you have the right interpreter and they get the information. And knowing number 41 by heart saved me the aggravation of scrolling through the whole list of languages. But somehow in this rollout, another language had been added, bumping Spanish to number 42. But my finger still went to 41 automatically so every patient that day came out speaking Serbian. And then all of a sudden, three brand new fields popped up that I'd never seen before. Latex allergies, food allergies, and environmental allergies. Now we always had an allergies field that was required. Again, key for patient safety is knowing allergies, but you could enter any kind of allergy, whether it was medications or food, even free text and allergy. I was sometimes tempted to write an EMR allergy, but I restrained myself but now they had three new required fields and each one demanded my attention. Now, it's not that I think that latex, food and environmental allergies are unimportant. They're of course very important, but their inopportune debut made a hard day even harder. I typically type most of my notes after the patient has left the room to avoid having to have the computer as the focus of the visit. So now I would encounter these new fields and face the prospect of sprinting out to flag down patients before they enter the elevator hollering incoherently about latex gloves, kiwi fruits, and cat dander, smack in the middle of the day when everyone was suddenly speaking Serbian. 
So that's an implementation issue, right? The allergies was very important. And, um, and I know why they made a special field for latex allergies and food allergies, but they didn't do it in a way that, that worked for us. They didn't tell us that it was happening and suddenly we all were thrown out. And in, in the same update, they moved the past medical history. It used to be number eight, but they add something so it all moved up and now number eight was past obstetrical history. And I automatically added number eight and then all my male patients ended up with their obstetrical history, which I learned you couldn't delete. So now a whole cohort of my male patients have their obstetrical history duly noted. And, and this illustrates that so many patient safety interventions, even the most well-intentioned ones, don't really think about how human beings work and how we think. And, and I was very intrigued in my research for the book by the work of ETL Drawer, who's a cognitive neuropsychologist who, who writes a lot about how so many of our patient safety interventions fail because they're not brain friendly. They don't think the way, uh, they're not implemented the way we actually think. So, you know, our, our brains were faced with tons of information every day. And if we had to think logically about every bit, we'd never function. For example, if a patient came in with burning in their stomach and I pulled out my Harrison's textbook of internal medicine off the shelf and I leaf through each page and I got to page 1,371 where it comes to dyspepsia and reflux and gastritis, I'd probably get the diagnosis right. It would also take me 12 hours and we couldn't get through all patients. So our brains are very snappy. They have these shortcuts. And I said, oh, you know, burning in your stomach, this, this, and that, boom, that's reflux disease. I got it. I diagnose it. And these shortcuts, these heuristics as they're called, they make us really smart. They enable our brains to function in a sea of information but they can also make us prone to error because sometimes we take shortcuts and we actually make mistakes. And, and so if you think about it, the, the sort of shortcut process is both this incredible um, reason that we're so smart and smarter than, than most many other animals, I'll say, but it also makes us prone to, to mistakes. And so we have to think about when we throw in another intervention, like another field in electronic medical record, we have to understand that we humans take shortcuts and we jump to number 41, but of course, if you change it, we will make mistakes that sometimes cannot be undone. But the electronic medical record and technology can, can really help us find, find medical errors. Um, there was one great case of a hospital in which there was an outbreak of C. diff colitis, which is a fungal, in, uh, which is a uh, bacterial infection that is very serious and spreads very easily. And it's one of the few things that doesn't get killed by the hand sanitizer. You need to actually wash hands with soap and water and use bleach on things. And it can be very hard to track down where the outbreaks happen in a hospital. And in this one hospital, what they were able to do with the electronic medical record that they couldn't do without it is track the data for all the patients, really every minute of the day of their entire stay, every place they went to, to the GI suite, to CAT scan, you know, uh, down to the echo suite, all of these things, every staff member they've ever interacted with at every moment and cross match that with their um, cultures. And they were able to pinpoint the outbreak to a single CAT scan machine, one out of maybe 20 machines that hadn't been cleaned appropriately. And that's an, an amazing uh, uh, thing that electronic medical records can do that would be much harder for us, uh, we humans to do. But electronic medical error, uh, records can, um, technology can also introduce errors. Right, we, we have um, the issue of alarms, right? Every time uh, a monitor uh, detects a patient's heart rate being too low or too high, an alarm goes off. Uh, and the alarms are made so sensitive, so we don't miss anything, but the result is that we have alarms going off all the time. And if you walk by a telemetry unit or in the ICU, it's nonstop alarms. And the truth is the vast majority are false alarms, um, but it can be to the point that we end up tuning them out. And when, uh, and the same thing goes for um, medication interactions. When you go to order a medication, alerts will pop up of possible interactions, which is very helpful. Unfortunately, sometimes there'll be 50 or 100 alerts will come up and you can't possibly read them. I, I, one day I actually tried to read every last alert for a patient of mine who was on Coumadin. Coumadin is a blood thinner that notoriously interacts with really everything under the sun. And I didn't get past the third medication. It was by the dozens, by the scores that came up. And I ended up like everyone else does, ignoring them all and just clicking, okay, okay, okay. Now it makes me angry because I know that buried in there, there are a couple of very important ones, 
but they're mixed in with all kinds of unimportant ones. I mean, you can be a female in your 60s and pregnancy warnings still come up. And if you're using alcohol pads or some kind of weight-based dosing that goes with alcohol pads and all sorts of minutiae that really drown out the important stuff. And so, and we know the reason they do this, right? They wanna make sure, oh, doctor was aware. So if we get sued, we, you know, we can blame them because they obviously saw that. So it's kind of a shift of liability, um, but it doesn't really work the way we, we think. Um, so, um, you know, when, when I think about, um, you know, medicine and medical error, we really have to think about medicine um, as a team sport. And sometimes it feels like patients and doctors aren't opposing teams, but, you know, we're really all on the same team. And, you know, patients and families who are the ones that are sort of on the ground, you know, with the patient seeing everything often have a hard time speaking up and, and, and contradicting their nurses and doctors, raising points that seem uncomfortable. And it can be very, very difficult if you're in pain or have a fever or frightened or nervous to speak up and say, hey, I don't know why, you know, why are you giving me that medication or, or what is this for? <clears throat> but I think we have to, um, as patients, be courageous to speak up and as uh, healthcare providers, doctors and nurses, be open to our patients talking about, you know, uh, what's actually happening um, with them. So I know I want to leave time for, for Q&A, so I'm just going to read one more small passage from the book and then open the uh, floor for discussion. A generation or two, the medical system was viewed with unmitigated reverence. Now the pendulum has swung so far the other way that many view the medical world with such suspicion that they avoid even routine and well-validated medical care. The truth settles somewhere in between. Medical science has made enormous strides in the past century and has objectively decreased mortality and suffering on a grand scale. Our great grandparents would give their eye teeth for the medical benefits that we take for granted today. Vaccinations, anesthesia, cancer treatments, heart transplants, dialysis. But there's no doubt that medical care also causes harm, a good deal of which is likely preventable. Patients and families, as well as medical staff, should cast a careful questioning eye on all medical tests and treatment. Medicine is a team sport. And that team isn't just the doctors and nurses, but also the patients and families and closest friends. And too often it feels like we're, if not being a, uh, on opposite sides, we have opposing agendas. But really there's just that one goal to help the patient get better. There's a plethora of technology out there to assist the patient in getting better, but the responsibility for making sure it all works, that falls to the humans. The Institute of Medicine certainly picked the title of its groundbreaking report well. This is the report from 20 years ago. To err definitely is human. It's also human, however, to care about what happens when error occurs. This holds for the immediate aftermath of the individual patient, as well as for thinking forward more broadly about how to minimize errors for all patients. We all enter the medical system with the expectation that we will come out better at the other side or at least not worse off. We certainly have the right to expect that medical care itself does not make us worse off. Almost 2,500 years ago, Hippocrates offered some advice to his fellow Greek healers, writing in his treatise of the epidemics. He said, as to diseases, make a habit of two things, to do good or to at least do no harm. And no one I think has said it has said it better ever since. So thank you so much for listening and um, we're happy to take questions and discussion. You can type in your questions uh, to the host and they'll read them out um, and, or you can send them via social media as well. Thank you for that fantastic discussion. So our first question is from Christian Andres on Facebook. He's asked, as a clinical professor, have you noticed that rising physician slash medical students are more apt to adapt to changes in electronic medical health rec record protocol, or do they face the same learning curve that veteran physicians do? It's a great question. The question's about electronic medical record and kind of the, the younger generation of, of digital natives opposed to the older ones who you know were the immigrants. And, and I think on the one hand, maybe they're a little less frightened off than you know, some of us older physicians were initially. Um, 
But I think in the end, once everyone gets the hang of the basics, that part's not the issue. And I think the intrinsic ways that medical records can make things both safer and easier, but also harder and potentially more dangerous exists for, for um, the whole generation. The, the one thing that might be a little different is that this generation never trained in the era without them. So it never had the experience of talking to a patient without any technology between them. And, and that you know, is one part that's very special about medicine. And I think for those of us who trained before the EMR, we remember those days and really try to hold on to them. And I think where it actually, um, we find that mutual zone of benefit is during the physical exam. And there's no doubt that physical exam is probably less important than it was two generations ago. We have much better diagnostic technology, but it's obviously still important. And there are many things we find in physical exam that we've missed in the history or in the blood test. But I find the physical exam to be especially helpful now because it's the only time that we get to interact without any technology between us. It's just two people we're touching um, and it becomes very intimate and not in romantic intimacy, but in an intimate way that countless times I find that uh, it's only during the physical exam that a patient will say what's really on their mind, whether it's issues of um, awkward symptoms, sexual symptoms, genital symptoms, um, depression, anxiety, uh, whether it's issues about domestic violence or abuse, often they only come up during the physical exam. And I think it's because it's the first moment in the interaction that we're interacting directly and there's no computer or tablet between us. Fantastic. And so uh, the next question is from Indrani Das who asks, do you have any advice for young trainees about moving beyond the guilt and shame of making an error? Uh, that's an excellent question and a, an enormous uh, a question. And I, you know, we talk about, um, we want to find the medical errors really before they happen or know where they are so we know how to intervene. The problem is we don't know where most errors are occurring because most of us won't, don't wanna talk about it. It's just too difficult. And so the errors that we actually hear about are really the tip of the iceberg. And there's an enormous you know, boulder under the water of the near misses, the almost errors, and the errors that happened, but you know, we didn't say anything about them. And, and again, that points to the primacy that we need to understand how human beings work. You can make a checklist to prevent errors, but you can't checklist guilt, shame, embarrassment, fear, anxiety, all the things that are relevant to making errors. And, and um, I've made my own share of errors. And some of my biggest ones when I was a younger physician, I didn't talk about for some, in some cases, 10 or 20 years because the shame is so overpowering. And I think the important thing is to distinguish um, between the error and the person that we may, may make an error. And of course we all will make errors, but we ourselves are not the error. And I think that's hard to distinguish in the moment when we've made an error, we feel like the error that we should quit medicine and you know go someplace and, and, and make patients safe by staying somewhere in an office or a desk job. But if every doctor or nurse who made an error quit, there would be nobody left to take care of patients. That would be the true adverse outcome for our patients. So I think we have to recognize that errors will happen. And we hear slogans like, you know, get rid of every medical error. It's a great thought, but it's not realistic. We'll never get rid of all errors. We wanna make medicine safer and decrease errors, but we have to recognize that errors will occur and that is normal and human. The question is, can we try to minimize the harm from the error? And that when it happens, that we have someone we can go to about the error, whether it's a mentor or a colleague to help us deal with the error and then help us help the patient deal with the error because it's important uh, for the patient also to recognize when an error has happened. And it may be hard for a doctor or a nurse to talk about it. And sometimes having another person help us is really what makes it possible. Well, so beyond that, uh, sort of relatedly, what sort of guidance would you provide to healthcare providers around disclosing those errors to patients? You know, there's no doubt that the issue of malpractice, and that's, you know, a topic for a whole hour discussion by itself, comes into play. We know, especially here in the U.S., that, that malpractice and litigation is the way that we handle medical errors. It's not so in other countries. Um, and so on a grand scale, I think we want to think about, can we change the system? malpractice system helps very few patients. Um, and 
it helps very few doctors as well. And it doesn't necessarily make the system any safer. It makes it more terrifying and fraught and a lot of defensive medicine is practiced, but I don't think it actually benefits patients as a whole. So we, we do recognize that, that if we say something and we're often told say nothing. Now, I think we're in society starting to recognize that that's not a helpful thing. And so many states have passed laws that actually protect healthcare workers that if they do want to make an acknowledgement or an apology about an error, that that itself cannot hold someone liable. I mean, to me, the model that I find fascinating that I explored in the book is, is the, the Scandinavian model where they've made a no fault system, something like workers' compensation, that if some kind of harm has happened, the main point is to help that person get uh, restitution or compensation for that, less about punishing the person. I mean, obviously if, if you know, it was blatant negligence, yes, the person should be punished, but mostly it's not. Most medical errors are, are inadvertent and certainly aren't, aren't deliberate and, and punishing that person doesn't do much for the cause, but helping the patient get restitution, get help where they need compensation when, um, if that can help, is something that's much more important. And so having a sort of a no fault system that assists patients that also is geared toward having a system in place to help that error not happen again would be key. Again, something that we don't really find in our current malpractice system. So then relatedly, uh, Sherry L. Herboit from Facebook asks or says, I work at a large hospital and it is hard to get physicians to actually report their error to risk management. How have you seen culture change happen to help physicians see this isn't about blame, but about patient safety and that it's their moral and ethical responsibility? You know, there's a number of parts to that question. So one thing is that reporting an error, A, is just a pain in the neck. I just have to say logistically, I mean, when things happen, I mean, every day there's five times as much work as you have the amount of time to do. So then taking the time to do what you have to do to report an error, it's so laborious that most of us, even if we wanted to do it, you know, it's not a very inviting process. But I, I, I can't put all the blame on that, but that's part of it. But I think, again, our, our emotions get in the way. We're so ashamed because we, we want to do good for our patients. We want to take care of our patients well. And the idea that we've harmed them is, is so intrinsic. And, and if you think about the distinction between guilt and shame, you know, guilt is about the thing that happened and shame is about you, the person. So guilt prods us to make amends, fix things, but shame is about you and shame makes you wanna run and hide under a rock and weep. And until we address the shame aspect, no matter how easy we make the error reporting system or how you know, much we appeal to people's ethical consciousness, it's not going to happen. So it's really a larger culture shift of helping doctors and nurses deal with the shame of the error to make it routine to simply file a report. Um, again, if you look at the Scandinavian system where they've sort of um, kind of de-escalated things where it's just, it's not about you know filing a report, it's just you know making a note of whatever happened that was an adverse outcome and not just errors, but all adverse outcomes um, to make it more common. And I think it really stems from uh, example from the top. So we need the, you know, the, the, the brass on top, not just to sort of walk the walk, um, not just to talk the talk, but to walk the walk and talk about their errors and demonstrate reporting errors. And, and also let us know that reporting errors is a positive thing. Often we get the subliminal message that reporting an error is actually problematic because someone's got to follow up and there's got to be a report. And so we often get the mixed message or yeah, it's important, but you know, don't make our work any harder than it needs to be. Fantastic. So for a slight shift in questions, we have Taylor Costin who asked, I know you mentioned running into technical difficulties when trying to implement change, but how did you manage slash approach the adaptive challenges? How do you address pushback from colleagues with their attitudes slash beliefs if there were any at all? Well, you know, I'm not on the administrative end of things, I'm on the receiving end. Um, but I, when I've been on the receiving end of different changes, I can tell you that it matters how the leadership implements the change. And sometimes, or with some leaders in certain cases, it comes down to this man, you just, you gotta do it. No matter, I don't care what you think, you know, you, you have to do these 17 new things. And that type of approach just doesn't work. It aggravates the nurses and doctors. Again, we're already so busy and have 
more than we can possibly handle. So 16 more things, like the whole example of the allergies thing. I know it's important, but if they'd said, hey, heads up guys, starting next week, we're going to have three new fields you have to do. Here's why we're doing, we've had our, you know, a whole bunch of un unnoticed latex allergies. And so here's the reason we're doing it. So when you log in on Monday, it's going to look a little bit different. Um, and that's why, and we're gonna give you a little extra time because we're changing the EMR. So for next week, we'll have, you know, 10% less workload. So you have a little more time to do it. Well, it might've worked a little bit better, but in fact, no one let us know. It just showed up and I started tripping over myself and I got frustrated and angry, even though I knew it was for a good reason. So I think it's really all in how we introduce it and recognizing that the, you know, the minions or we minions down below need to be involved and not just sort of have one more thing thrown upon us. And there's much less pushback. You know, um, in the last six weeks, our hospital has changed 50,000 degrees. And hospital bureaucracies, they're not known for their fleetness of foot. We wanted to get a microwave for our staff area. I think it took two years. In three weeks, we tripled our intensive care capacity, doubled our hospital capacity, doubled our staff. It was amazing to see how fast a hospital can change. And I think the difference is that there was a mission, everyone was engaged, we had a common purpose, um, and it all felt reasonable, real, and urgent. And very often, and so we had the whole, the buy-in of all the staff was there. So often the initiatives, we don't have the buy-in of the staff, we just sort of throw it upon them. So again, it's the situation, the circumstance, and really how it's implemented makes all the difference. So on the topic of the most recent situation, we have a question from Alyssa McInery, who asks, what are your thoughts about the potential for medical errors during the COVID pandemic? I am a pediatric trained allergy fellow, and I am currently redeployed as an adult internal medicine attending on a COVID inpatient unit. Where is the line between do no harm and the need for additional providers? That's an excellent question. I think we've all been thinking that. I mean, we have Again, ophthalmologists, dermatologists, you know, do, acting as medical interns, orthopedists doing that. Um, so this is a really an extenuating circumstance, I would say, that we've really been in a position of having to, again, double our capacity. Um, you know, COVID has largely been a disease of the Department of Medicine, and we've had to double our capacity, which means taking people from all other departments who have been enthusiastic, willing, able, and, and stepped in without any question but you're right, we have people who are doing things beyond their typical scope of ability. And normally we would not do that. And I, I think in this case, we didn't have a chance to, you know, to do it any, any other way. Um, but I think we can learn from that, that we do need to have our capacity you know, in the areas uh, you know, of, of this. And we've gradually been able to get people from across the country in the fields, but you're right, um, it has put us in a very awkward situation. In terms of medical errors, I mean, there's no doubt that when we are rushing and scrambling, you know, errors happen. And I've seen, you know, quite a few. I mean, we've when you have patients doubled up in places where normally a single patient is, when you have six different kinds of ventilators, all of different makes and models, all the IV drips, patient come come patients come in faster than you can, you know, keep track. Um, you know, things do unfortunately slip. I, and I, I've seen people being as rigorous. Um, as possible and, and the exquisiteness of care is remarkable. The fact that there have been as few errors as we've seen, I think is a testament to people's determination and people aren't leaving till everything is done, but you know, it will happen. So I think we do have to, the, the do no harm is very important, but we have to weigh the risk and benefit. And so if we, you know, we have to put an ophthalmologist in the dialysis unit um, or the option is no one in the dialysis unit, then we have to do that under normal circumstances, we'd have to be much more careful. Yes, but thank you for doing the redeployment. All right. And our next question, which is sort of related is from Charlotte Ayers who asks, what should patients know when going into a COVID unit? Um, well, so, so right now it depends where you are. I would say in most hospitals in New York, the entire hospital is a COVID unit. Although we do expect that to be gradually changing. 
And, and many hospitals now are trying very hard to separate patients with COVID and those without COVID. Not as easy as it sounds, our tests are not perfect. So we have patients who may have COVID but test negative and, and vice versa. So we're very much doing our best. Um, do be aware, as I think everyone is by now, what universal precautions should be. And that is everyone should be wearing a mask and that hand washing should be absolutely rigorous and, and um, the most OCD you can be about hand washing, that's where the money is. And so if anyone's coming at you without washing their hands, you are well within your rights to point that out. Um, and then I think just in general, as for all medical you know, uh, admissions to the hospital or to doctor's offices, you want to, as best you can, keep a notebook, you know, write down what's happening, ask questions, ask what every medication is, um, ask how you can get in touch with your nurse or your doctor, if possible, to have someone with you. And obviously now that's, that's not possible, but in, you know, in normal times, we, we can do that. And, and don't be afraid to ask questions, but very much you know, be aware of, of hand hygiene and, and wearing masks. And I think that's universal. Okay, and then one last question on this subject from Amanda Galt on Facebook. She asks, what is your opinion on some medical schools pushing students to graduate sooner to help with COVID? So um, at, at our medical school, it is voluntary. They've been inviting students who wish to, who have finished their, all their requirements. And in, in this sense, it made sense. These are students who in two months would become an intern. So we felt that you know, two months was not that amount of time. And they're, they're uh, now deployed as junior interns and not really as full doctors. So they're being supervised quite heavily. Um, we have needed our medical students. And I think it's an appropriate thing to do in this kind of circumstance. At other times, no, um, but in this circumstance, you know, it's been extremely helpful to have the medical students um, to help us out. We really do need them. Great. And then, so we have time for two more questions. Our next one is going to be from, oh, sorry, from Pearl Schiffer, who asks that, who says that when entering a hospital, it can often feel like a patient is disempowered. And so what can be done for a patient to empower themselves in terms of knowing about errors and preparing for their own best safety and health? Well, I think you know, we've, we used to be a generation ago in this very paternal model of medicine where the medical team had the information and the patient just received the information, got the treatments. And I think we've shifted from that. And when I talk about the team, we really all are on the same team. I think that patients should expect to be part of that team. Um, but it's realistic to, realistic to recognize knowledge differences over the average patient, you know, won't be a pediatric nephrologist and, and can't weigh in with the same detailed information. But you can uh, expect that you should be informed of what's happening and that you are part of the decision making. Um, I mean, some things, maybe there aren't many options, but often there are options. And you should you know, make sure your doctors and nurses introduce themselves, tell them who you are. When anyone walks in, if they don't say who they are, you can stop and say, you know, everyone's walking around in scrubs, they all look the same. Who are you? What are you doing? You know, what's this test for? Um, and um, if you don't have luck with that, every hospital and every health organization has a patient advocacy office. And you can get that number quite easily and call them. That's what they're there for, to help you with that. Whether you need assistance with language translation, whether you're confused about your treatment, you're not feeling heard or need something you're not getting, use them. And the truth is most nurses and doctors are, are glad to explain the information. Often they forget when they're busy and, and, and running late, they shouldn't, but often do. And if you stop and say, hey, listen, I, I mean, if you yell at them and, and be disrespectful, it's not gonna help the cause. So, you know, be respect, understand that people are busy and, and overworked, but that's no excuse. And I think if you approach it in a respectful and, and inviting way, most staff, I think, are more than willing to, to uh, incorporate you into the team. And then our uh, last question of the evening is from Kay Landon, who asks, what are you seeing about the newest people coming into medicine that gives you hope for the future and makes you think that errors will be dealt with in a more appropriate manner? Well, I'm incredibly optimistic about the future of medicine. I know lots of people say, oh, it's terrible, I wouldn't go into medicine or nursing, I wouldn't tell my kids to go into it. I disagree entirely. I, I think that it's such an incredible place to be. And certainly 
these last six weeks has just proved um, how uh, special it is to, to be there. I also think if you look at generation, generationally over at medicine over the last say 20, 30, 40 years, you know, medicine's really changed. And the people who went into medicine for you know, the glory and the power and the money, they've long since left. I mean, there's much easier ways to make a good salary than to spend 10 years in a hospital, you know, wearing old scrubs and getting, you know, vomit on your shoes. There's much easier ways. And I think, you know, those people have left, which means that those who come into medicine now are in it for the right reasons. Those who choose to become nurses now are there because they really want to do this more than anything else. So I find that sort of the new crop of, of uh, people in healthcare to be incredibly inspiring. Um, and that they, their heart is in the right place. And I think what our job is as the educators is to preserve that, to help them not get beaten down by the system, to keep their moral compass directed you know, northward, to help them. You know, I think when, when medical students and nursing students start out, they're incredibly assiduous with their technique. They see something wrong, they jump on it right away. Then they get sort of the you know, uh, hidden curriculum, the mixed messages of, well, you know, don't speak up, don't make trouble, you know, don't uh, undermine someone else. Um, and then they, you know, end up not speaking up when, when they should. So I think that we have to help preserve their uh, intrinsic ethical uh, common sense and help them not get downtrodden by, by medicine. And if I can just add before, um, before we close, I know that, you know, whenever you give a, a talk at the medical school, you have to sign those forms about financial conflicts of interest. Um, but since literary journals don't earn any money, I have no compunction about shamelessly stumping for the Bellevue Literary Review. And I just wanna introduce our literary journal. This is the Bellevue Literary Review published twice a year through NYU and uh, published at Bellevue in which we publish fiction, poetry and nonfiction about health and healing. We publish twice a year um, and submissions can come from anyone. And uh, if you're interested, um, just look up Bellevue Literary Review into our website and we hope you subscribe and check out an issue. And thank you so much for joining us this evening.